Hi, thank you for watching Digging to China. I'm Dong Shang. The U.S. Navy has 101 ships deployed around the world, the same number as during the Cold War. Yet the entire fleet is only 297 vessels strong. That's about the half Reagan era level of Navy 600. The consequences of maintaining current global commitments with a shrunken fleet, including long deployments, some sailors spend close to a year at sea, as well as more maintenance and less time for training. The fleet doesn't have enough ships to meet global commitments, even as the US faces growing naval competition from China, Russia, Iran and North Korea. Each of these potential adversaries possesses missiles and aircraft whose sole purpose is to keep U.S. naval forces at bay. 64% of China's maritime trade and 40% of its overall trade flows through the South China Sea, through which U.S. naval ships sail regularly. Were hostilities to break out between China and the U.S., the conflict would be a naval one. It would test the U.S. ability to move naval and amphibious forces across the 7,000 miles Pacific moat in time to assist American allies and partners, deny China's use of the shipping lanes between it and the Middle East, and operate effectively to command the South China, East China, and the Yellow Sea. The Chinese Navy would be a formidable foe. It has long-range missiles, a nascent aircraft carrier force, and increasingly modern ships and weapons of all categories, as well as cyber and space capabilities. Simply building more U.S. ships and submarines wouldn't be enough to meet the challenge. Strategic thinking and a change in fleet design and tactics will be necessary. In the 1930s, the Navy and the Marine Corps identified Japan as a likely future enemy and developed and practiced the ideas of naval aviation and island hopping that eventually won the Pacific War. On December 17, then Navy Secretary Kenneth Braywaite released a document billed as a Tri-Service Maritime Strategy, signed by the Chiefs of the Navy, Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard. The Vantage at Sea correctly identified China as a pressing long-term threat and a cause for traditional and important actions such as integrated operations, allied participation, modernization, and sea control. But it isn't a maritime strategy. It offers no suggestions about how to win a naval war against China. Nothing prevents the Pentagon from articulating a strategy. During the Cold War, the U.S. maritime strategy told everyone from Congress to the Kremlin that in the event of war, the U.S. Navy would target enemy's ballistic missile submarine bastions and divert Soviet concentration from the Central Front in Germany by striking its oceanic flanks from the northern seas to the Mediterranean to the Pacific. The Navy used the strategy's stated goals to argue for the funds to build an enlarged fleet. The cold water training needed to prepare for conflict in northern seas and the composition of aircraft carriers' airwings. No similar strategy exists today partly because the Navy hasn't made it a priority to produce one and partly because tough battles have impeded into branch cooperation necessary to make it happen. In a May 1954 article in Proceedings, the U.S. Naval Institute's magazine, Samuel Huntington argued that the military services must have a strategic concept, which he described as a description of how, when, and where the military expects to protect the nation. If a military service does not possess such a concept, it becomes purposeless. Nothing has changed. Legislation passed in the 1980s placed a greater emphasis on coordination between the military services. It didn't absolve the military services of their obligation to articulate a strategy. China has a straightforward strategy. K 
keep the U.S. Navy from using its formidable capabilities to support allies and disrupt the regional and eventually global hegemony that China's rulers seek. The U.S. Navy is caught up in all the derivative issues that a clear strategy would address, such as budgets, training, ship numbers, and fleet composition. There is no maritime strategy for a conflict that would be waged at sea. There is no more important issue facing the American military. Here is how China assessed the U.S. naval strategy. China's National Institute for South China Sea Studies issued its assessment of the recently released U.S. maritime strategy at Vantage at Sea, prevailing with integrated all-domain naval power. It was written in Chinese. Below is a partial brief translation. This strategy strives to unify thinking for all of America's maritime forces, namely that the U.S. no longer has command of the global commons and that the strategic guidance that forward presence can shape regional security and prevent conflicts is now obsolete. All of America's maritime forces must now shift to greater power competition with China and Russia, fight for command of the sea, and gain the advantage. At the first glance, it seems that China has finally been thrust into the dangerous tempest of modern maritime competition as a great power. Keeping in mind China's vulnerable position in the maritime order since the age of sail, that China is now seen by the U.S. as an evenly matched opponent, whether for good or ill, means that we cannot just turn a blind eye and sit back and wait for death. First, the end of the Trump administration strategy does not mean that the strategy will quickly become a historical document. The keynote of America's new maritime strategy is a strict implementation of America's newest national security strategy and a national defense strategy. In the present context, in which Sino-U.S. strategic competition has become the high-level consensus of the two political parties in the Congress, it is certainly unlikely that the major adjustments will be made to the strategy after the new administration takes office. Second, the strategy aims to weaken China's advantages in the fight for command of the sea. It will intensify confrontation between Chinese and U.S. sea and air forces and might spark a conflict or even a regional war. Considering the U.S. combatant command-level Indo-Pacific strategic report and the divisions of the combatant commander, one can conclude that the U.S. efforts to weaken China's advantages will be implemented in conjunction with pushing back against China. The U.S. will continuously engage in saber-rattling. It will strengthen medium- and long-range power projection capabilities. As a result, U.S. military operations in the Western Pacific will be more frequent, more robust, and more focused on strike capabilities. Third, the U.S. will also introduce a new style of struggle. Namely, it will bolster competition in the gray zone. That is, the U.S. will take greater action in the domains of social media, supply chains, especially defense industry chains, and the space and the cyber. A very obvious early indicator of this was that the U.S. Coastal Guard, which traditionally operates in the vicinity of the U.S. coast to defend the security of U.S. territory, has recently moved forward into the South China Sea region. It is preparing to conduct military operations in the South China Sea with the aim of striking China's maritime forces as well as bolstering joint law enforcement with regional states in the South China Sea in order to respond to China's South China Sea rights protection operations. In the face of this severe maritime security challenge, China should strive to control potential maritime conflicts with the U.S., doing so in these four ways. First, it should maintain strategic restraint, making every effort to urge the U.S. to reduce its hostility toward China. 
Second, it should maintain the smooth operation of strategic communications channels and a crisis control mechanism in order to avoid the misunderstandings and the miscalculations that might give rise to conflict or an inadvertent armed clash. Third, it should take substantive actions to unite neighboring states to jointly safeguard regional security and peace. Fourth, it should promote global and regional maritime governance to restrain America's impulse to militarize maritime security. Let me conclude my program with a quote from Sun Tzu, author of Art of War. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Thank you for watching. Please leave a comment and subscribe to my channel. Just click the subscribe button right here. I'll see you again shortly.